the media. It ain't what it used to be. Well, it's so nice to see all of you here, some people I know, some people I don't know, and Emerson, Neil's alumni, who he is so passionate about, I welcome all of you here tonight. I must tell you, it's kind of unusual, I think, for a wife to be introducing their husband, but I must tell you that I think vicariously I have really lived every moment of this documentary. What you will uh, see tonight is the second half of a two-part series. The first part was based on the media and newspapers and the decline of newspapers in the United States that aired on PBS. And what you are about to see is the premiere, is the preview of the second documentary that deals with uh, the um, broadcast, cable, and the internet. I must tell you something. Neil, from way back when, as a career journalist, has produced and directed national television programs, programs for Armed Forces Network throughout Europe, <coughs> worked for ABC, Reuters, Bloomberg, and has always said throughout all of those experiences, that he wanted to produce his own documentary. And he knew that if he did a documentary on the media, that might not be the most promising in terms of dollars and cents. And he said it didn't matter. He said, this is a time in my life, I really want to do it. It's not about money, it's simply about my passion. So I must tell you that I really respect that he did it without any mitigation at all. He really and truly put his heart and soul in the development of this documentary. So I introduce my husband with a great deal of respect for tonight and the preview of the second half of the documentary, The Media. Now that is a real introduction. <laughs> I want to welcome the members of the National Arts Club for uh, sponsoring this event and welcoming them to their club. Uh, this is the second year that we have been able to present a preview of a documentary we've worked on. Uh, last year, we presented uh, the media 2010, and it was about the demise of newspapers. And there is a connection between newspapers and television and cable, which, which we'll get into very quickly. I also want to welcome members of the Deadline Club of New York, and I also am very, very pleased that the New York chapter of Emerson College is here in force, and uh, part of this event uh, will support uh, the Emerson Alumni Association. So I'm pleased to be able to make uh, that contribution as well. There are a lot of people that have participated in these documentaries, and we will uh, touch on that a little later. But a lot has happened in television, and cable, and the internet. And just as a pickup from last year, last year newspapers were really, really in trouble. And they were losing advertising, and subscriptions and losing a lot of money. And last year, we actually lost a lot of newspapers, very, very important newspapers. 
Newspapers for years have always set the news cycle, which means that in the morning at uh, 4, 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning, in every newsroom, whether it's a network newscast, whether it's a, a, a talk show, it's radio, it's the internet, every medium starts the cycle, the news cycle, by reading the first edition of the newspapers. And with the demise of papers, it really leaves a great void in our news cycle. So last year, we focused on uh, newspapers, and we had an event here at the National Arts Club to preview and kick it off. We were picked by the New York Times as the program, the lead program of that day. And that day, back in the spring, we beat every news network with this program. And we were in a time period that was uh, owned for many years called Now. And we doubled the audience in New York and nationally on, with, in that time period. So we really had a major victory a year ago. So tonight, we hope uh, we duplicate that again. And this documentary is about television, cable television, and the internet. The most important thing you should know before we start this, uh, this preview, is that the Radio Act of 1933 set the broadcast industry and broadcast news into, into a, an organized, reasonable cycle. Up until 1923, we had what, what was called the wild, wild west of radio. Radio stations were coming on the air all over the country, and some were interfering with other stations, and there were no rules, no regulations, and the Congress of 1933 passed the Radio Act. And one component of the Radio Act happened to be the Fairness Act, the Fairness Doctrine. And it, didn't mean that every program had to be 50-50, but there had to be a token on every program that had either a conservative or a liberal. And uh, I think many of us remember Bill Buckley. Bill Buckley used to do a television show on PBS as well as a daily radio show. But every single program had a token from the other side, which means that viewers listened. And, and, and Bill, Bill Buckley, by the way, as a conservative, had a field day with liberals and progressives. But people said, at least there's another point of view. And the other point of view at least gave us an even playing field. In 1987, the Reagan administration went through a complete reorganization of the financial industry. Banking and the controllers were, were deregulated. And they also deregulated the communications industry. And as soon as Ronald Reagan, in 1987, threw out the Fairness Act, equal, which was not equal time, but barely equal time, it changed everything. We have programs that are produced by liberals, and we have programs that are, that are produced by uh, conservatives. And now we have three hours of programs by Rush Limbaugh, and we have uh, pro programs uh, by uh, Hannity, and, uh, and Combs does a liberal program. But there's, there are no two sides to any of these programs. 
So what we're going to see on this uh, documentary is how things have changed, how they have progressed. So let us run the tape and let us see the preview of this year's 2011 uh, program. I'm Morton Dean. On this report of the media, journalism in crisis, we focus on television news, cable TV, and the internet. As a young reporter, I, like most of my colleagues, learned the importance of the five W's and the one H. In each story we reported, these basic questions had to be answered. Who, what, where, when, why, and how? Nowadays, these are questions being asked about the media itself. Who's responsible for the distrust of the media felt by so many Americans? What's gone wrong? When will things change for the better? Where's the business headed? Why is so much of the mass media owned by only half a dozen giant corporations? And how can a business that's so essential to the success of democracy, our democracy, right itself? How did a trusted source of news go from the hallowed days of Edward R. Murrow Doug Edwards, Walter Cronkite, Chet Huntley, David Brinkley, and Peter Jennings to today's growing distrust, dismissal, and anger aimed squarely at the media. At NBC Nightly News, we have all day to look up at all the cable channels on the monitors in the newsroom and distill what we see. Think about it, run it by some experts, put it on the air. When I was in cable, it was instantaneous. Not that we wouldn't put it through the same traps and checks, but there is more pressure to turn it around, get it on. From even-tempered treatment on TV and radio, we now have fluffy news light and shouting attacks interspersed with numerous commercials. One at a time. Okay. Now, what seems to make it the most, and which is why they're watching cable, is everybody screams, everybody gives their opinion, and they're considered journalists, and indeed they are. And that's very different. As corporate conglomerations continue to get larger, cross-partnerships create fewer sources of news. The media scoreboard needs to be checked and updated frequently. What we've got is a kind of capital process that's about taking over the market. And the media is no different. The media in corporate hands is no different. It's not good enough to have a station or a channel or a newspaper or a radio station. You want them all because then you've really got a profit center. You don't have to compete with anybody. Does the sheer mass of today's multimedia information available to the instant access generation make the answer the Internet? An increasing number of television manufacturers seem to think so, strenuously working to make Internet access a standard feature on future television sets. We are in a situation in America where if anybody wants news, there's more information available than ever before in human history. You not only have the three traditional networks, you have, uh, you have cable news all the time, you have, um, you have C-SPAN, which is the equivalent of a transcription service. You have uh, the internet all the time. You have a national public radio bringing you in-depth coverage from around the world. While some say it may be premature to tell if the internet is the great equalizer, the tech-savvy user will function not just as viewer, but as editor by weeding through the unregulated, unfiltered, and Wild West Internet sites. Are we stuck with what passes for news these days? Certainly, the glory age of television news is over. Hopefully, news consumers will find reliable sources that over time can be counted on for credible and trustworthy information. I'm Morton Dean.